big episode. I grew up watching this man in awe. I could say, ooh, Monty Python. I, I could say, Faulty Towers. I could say, A Fish Called Wonder. Surely, all I have to say is, John Cleese. Ah, <laughs> there he is. Where are you, Rob? I am at my home in Strawberry Hill, which is in between Twickenham and Teddington. Oh, I'm nice. That's a lovely book. Where are you? I'm in Los Angeles because I have two daughters here. Well, listen, it's lovely to see you. I don't know if you remember that we met in Edinburgh. Well, I remember doing a sort of chat with you. It was a charity event called The Big Sleep. <laughs> Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, that's right. It was Scotland, though, was it? That's it was, yes, in Edinburgh. But I remember you did some very funny impersonations, a skill that I very much envy. Yeah, I was reading in, in my notes about you that you, you singled out Sellers as, the, you said, the greatest voice man ever. I mean, he had an extraordinary ability, didn't he? Yes, he did. And I began to, I worked with him for some time in about 67, 68. Graham Chapman and I wrote through mo three movies for him. Only one was made, which was called The Magic Christian. But I spent quite a lot of time with him. And uh, we would uh, write some pages and we would go over to his flat in Mayfair. But it's quite a good story. I'll turn it on air if you like. Yes, please. Are we on air now? Have we oh, started? John, we yeah, we started. You this this is this is how the young kids do it. You know, everything is gold. <laughs> Very good. Well, Graham Chapman and I used to go over to Peter Sellers Mayfair apartment, and um, uh, we would show him the pages we'd done the previous day, and he would say, "I like this," and I didn't like that, and I liked him very much. I found him very easy to work with, and what was lovely was that he had a great sense of humor. When he laughed, he really laughed, you know? And that, I, I had great affection for him, but a very odd thing happened. One day we arrived and his chauffeur, who sort of looked after everything, Bert, his name was, said he's overslept. And after a time, Peter emerged from the bedroom in his dressing gown, apologizing for being late, but not using a voice that we'd heard before. And then as he came across the room towards us, he sort of changed into something rather fruity, rather as though he's speaking. And then all of a sudden he's down that east end, you know, talking like that. And then he sits down on the sofa and goes into some strange Balkan accent. And then suddenly he was speaking to us in his ordinary voice. And I checked this with Graham afterwards. I said to Graham, I think that's what happened. He said, that's exactly what happened. And we realized that in the morning, Peter had to find his own voice. God, God. And you see, I think it was because, and I don't mean this about you, but I've noticed that the greatest impersonators are often people with a certain character deficiency, a personality deficiency. Um, and I think the reason is that if I try and impersonate someone, I sound like John Cleese trying to impersonate someone. Yeah. But people who are going to have a great deal of personality can take on another person's personality and their own doesn't push its way through, doesn't get in the way. I do a handful of impressions. For, for me, it's, it's always a love letter. It's always people yes, that I, yes. I admire. So I would, you'd never find me doing Trump or, 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 or whoever. <laughs> <laughs> Although he has a fascinating and eminently doable voice. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a very tempting. He has so many vocal tics and mannerisms. Now, I'd love to know your take on this, that comedy is in so many ways a pressure valve. It's, it, it's a release valve and it's a way of coping with the ills of society. Yes, absolutely. What it does is it reduces tension. Yes. Yeah, you know, yeah. which is very important because we are much better creatures when we're relaxed than when we're tense. We're much more interesting creatures. The biggest laughs come if you're talking about a slightly taboo subject. I mean, the obvious thing is sex. People are always ever so slightly uncomfortable when you mention sex, which is why lots of very rather poor jokes about sex um, get big laughs because there's a release of tension.
But as I, I, I often say in my stage show that if you look, if you'd make jokes about violence and death and sex and those sort of things, taboo areas, you will get a bigger laugh than you would if it wasn't about a taboo area. I mean, I'll give you an example. There's a, uh, a very simple one. I was in Cleveland once. Have you ever been there? No. No, or well, don't. It <laughs> terrible place. And I said to one of the Cleveland guys, I said, why do you live here? I mean, were you sentenced to live here? <laughs> and he said, no, but I can't sell my apartment. And he said, no, condominium. And he said, we have a saying here, what's the difference between gonorrhea and a Cleveland condominium? And the answer is you can get rid of gonorrhea. <laughs> it's quite a nice joke. But if I tell that, if I say well, what's the difference between a head cold and a Cleveland, you can get rid of a head cold, it just lies there. Yeah, that's right. So it's because you've said gonorrhea and a little bit of anxiety that you get a laugh. And so anytime you can mess around with death, then your laughs are good, and then you get extra laughter, which is all to do with the fact that some special energy is released because the anxiety is released when you laugh. And also, I think you, I, I'm touring a stage show at the moment and, I, and I, I can attract a wide audience, but I do get a fair amount of older people. So I make a lot of jokes about hoping they make it to the interval and, and all that kind of stuff, you know. And, and, and it gets a laugh because it touches on a very real, a very real concern, which they were hoping to park for the night. And then it comes back into the room with them. That's right. Well, I mean, you see, death is taboo. You're not supposed yeah. to talk about death. I have a whole routine about it, which I like because a few people feel better afterwards. If you laugh at something, it becomes less of a threat, which is why I think dictators and horrible people like that cannot stand mm. being made fun of. Now, look, I wanted to sort of trot through uh, your life, and I particularly wanted to ask you about the famous sketch the, the class sketch where Ron says, oh, yes. I know my place. Now, now you performed that with um, Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett, and that was the Frost Report, wasn't it? 1966. Right. We used to do um, a show each week on a different subject. It might be authority or it might be health or it might be class. And that sketch stuck in people's minds more than anything else, particularly when you get to Ronnie Corbett at the end and he says, oh, no, my place. <laughs> but what I, what I think wouldn't work now is, is what, what there is in that sketch of yours is deference. And there's, yes. no, there's no deference now, is there? No, that's quite right. That, and that went, well, I saw that go away. I mean, during my uh, early days, it was a very de deferential society. And I remember once seeing a BBC reporter speaking to the prime minister before the prime minister made his speech. And it was Wilson or, or Macmillan or someone like that. And it was like the head boy um, sort of pretending to interview the headmaster. That deference was destroyed in a very short period of time because I saw Beyond the Fringe, which is Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett, Jonathan Miller, which is still the greatest show I've ever seen. When they got to London, there was a small social revolution because nobody had ever seen anybody make fun of the prime minister. And Michael Frayne says he was sitting behind a sort of upper middle class um, uh, couple and uh, they, they suddenly realized that Peter Cook was doing an impersonation of Macmillan. He said, oh, I went all over Europe. I went to Germany and met her, uh, her, 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 um, her and her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and five or six months later, David Frost was doing that was the week that was. So it spread from London all over the country. And that was the end of deference. And of course, in the, in those days, the, the 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 few channels that there were, meant that if you were a hit, you were huge with a great impact on society. I think that's right, Rob. Because when we were doing the Frost Report, we used to get fourteen million, uh, and we did it live. I have never been so frightened in my life. 
I mean, one of the biggest shows I ever did were at the O2 in 2014, 16,000 yeah. every night. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah and, and I assumed I was going to be terrified and I wasn't. And it was because there was such goodwill in the, in, in the room. And what you felt at the end was that everyone was happy and friendly. And I remember sitting there thinking, this is good. Yeah. There is goodwill yeah. and friendliness in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what laughter can create, you know. I was there at the O2 for the last night of your run with Python, and it was it was joyous, and, and it struck me that it was like a secular church. Well, there was a lot of goodwill. I mean, they'd come from all over the planet to thank us and it was a sort of a, a generosity of, of, of spirit in that huge arena with the result that you weren't scared as a performer because if you failed or fucked up nobody minded yeah. <laughs> you know it was it was a remarkable atmosphere actually have you come across many comedians gifted comedians who in in private in social settings don't want to give anything away and are rather somber many no i think when i've met comedians on the whole i've always wondered when they said oh are they all gloomy are they, is it all a reaction to the fact they're not very happy uh, i don't think they're very different from any other creative people i think that creative people are different from accountants and act actuaries and i think the reason is i've thought about this a lot i think that real creativity comes from our unconscious it doesn't matter. The research shows this because I'm quite familiar with it. It doesn't matter how brilliant and logical and critical and phenomenal memory you are. If you can't play, you can't be creative. And that's something that we're never taught at school uh, with the result that we lose the ability to play. And if you lose the ability to play, then you can't be creative because playing is just playing with ideas out of kind of joy. If you get really interested in a problem and you play with it, that's when your creativity comes in. You, you've talked about creativity a lot. Am I right in saying uh, you, you, the, the lack of distraction is important? Yes. Am I remembering that Absolutely. properly? Yeah. When you first sit down and you close the door and you say to someone like your wife or the secretary or the cat, don't disturb me unless there's a fire. The first 15 minutes is full of thinking, oh, Christ, I should have called Chris, or I didn't buy the cat a birthday present. What's interesting about that observation, you say in the first 15 minutes, when one tries to meditate, the first yes. six or seven yes. minutes, you, you have the most effective to-do list and you think, I can't waste my time sitting here. I've, I, I've just remembered all the things I need to do. <laughs> Exactly. And that, it is exactly like meditation. And, and if you don't pay attention to it, it quiets. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, you find you can really think about what you want to think about. How has your creativity changed with age? When I was younger, and the first things that, that went well for me, that there was so much creativity and, and, and a hunger and, um, and I could invent stuff. I have a much more comfortable, happy life now. So I'm not quite, I'm not looking for that release. H has yours changed over the years? I think there's two things that get confused. One is creativity and the other is productivity. That there are people who are very driven. Yes. And they tend to be enormously productive, but they're not necessarily very creative because that drivenness can kind of take the space that could be used for play. Yeah, yeah. People are always driving forward. And um, once I thought of that, I found that the periods when stuff didn't come very easily, instead of thinking, oh, God, I'm no good, I can't do this, why am I being so stupid? I just think, all right, well, this is just a period Well, my unconscious is making a bit of space for, for something new, which makes it much easier to tolerate the times when it, it doesn't come. And as you know, anyone creative knows that some days it flows and some days it doesn't. You can't control it, and that's because it's coming from the unconscious. You can't control the unconscious. You just have to be able to be friendly with it and know how to trick it.
like yesterday, I'm writing with John Dupay. We were writing a musical together. And I was uh, having a peek. I came back and said, oh, you let him sing, let Otto sing this song right at the start of the year. Beautiful idea. We wrote the lyric in about 10 minutes, but it came when I was having a pee. You tantalisingly said you mentioned the word Otto. Does that mean this is a Fish Called Wanda musical? Yes, that's right. Oh, that's right. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. we've been working on it for some time. My daughter and I wrote, rewrote the book. and We're very happy with the book. We changed everything. We've actually got a rather nice way into it, which is that I come out and I say, say to the audience, did you ever see the film? <laughs> it's just a strange thing to say at the beginning of a musical. And a few people say, yes. I said, well, today we're going to show you what really happened. Because, of course, when they made a film, they changed everything. And I like that because it immediately the audience says, oh, it's not just going to be, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to be something else. And I think that's a clever device. John, a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for your time. And uh, I hope I Great. see you soon nice again. To see you. Good to talk to you. Bye, Bye John. Bye.